Hey, Zim, how's it going? Good, Mitch. How are you? I'm doing really good. Uh, my first question, who are you and what do you do? Who am I? Well, thanks. First of all, thanks a lot for having me on. I'm, I'm really stoked. I love uh, being on this side of the conversation. Totally. It's good to talk to you again. Like, yeah, for sure. Well, and then we'll do it again. Like we're, we're planning on doing another high crime on word on the street. So speaking about what I do, one of the thing, main things I do is podcasts. I have a uh, three. So I go by Zim or the Zim. Um, my, uh, I do a lot of stuff, so it's really hard to decide what to talk about first, but, um, I just mentioned <clears throat> podcasts. So I do Word on the Street podcast, which is all about the Seattle Northwest music community. I do MFA Chronicles podcast, which is kind of like um, some form of, form of documentation of my journey as a graduate student and artist, a visual artist at San Diego State University and kind of doing that whole thing now. So we maybe get into that later. But um, I'm also, I consider myself a creative and I play music as well. I make visual art. I'm a dad. I like to, I have two kids. They're pretty important to me. Um, but yeah, okay. I'll leave it at that for now. And then I'm sure other things will come up as we talk. Yeah. Let's plan to touch on all of that. Uh, <laughs> first let's start with the word on the street podcast. That's how I first got to know you. You interviewed, uh, me and Brielle from high crime back in 2018. Uh, you've been hosting the podcast and conducting interviews with Seattle musicians now for six years this month. Uh, so far has it been that long. Yeah, 2014? No November 2014. Yeah, you looked up the first day. Yeah, yeah, that's uh -huh. right. <laughs> uh, you've done 210 episodes so far. You asked us some great questions. And I'm curious if there's a pattern with any answers you get, like kind of seeing takeaways from talking to people. So, for example, you asked us, uh, like, what is our end game uh, for like our career as a musician? And I know we said something along the lines of that, yeah, we want to be able to write, record, and tour our music full time, like the typical kind of bands we, we are inspired by. Um, is something like that, is that an answer that you hear a lot from other musicians? Does everyone want to go do this professionally or, or do a lot of people just want to do it for fun, artistic expression, and they don't have the career aspiration? That's a okay, long question, yeah. but yeah. No, no, that helped. That helped um, understand how to answer the question because really I kind of somewhat know going into the interview, what kind of answers I'm going to get. Cause I like my goal is you, my definite goal with that podcast is to talk to musician people in the community, mostly musicians, because musicians seem to be the easiest to access, but like, you, they I like talking like, about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> like you, I think with this podcast and this idea, you're trying not to just talk about musicians only or you know it's like you want to i with word on the street i always wanted to talk about the culture of the scene so i wanted to get the perspective of every kind of nuance and aspect of it from owners to venues to bookers to you know other podcasters and bloggers and media types and all that but as things settled it was really difficult to get anybody other than musicians on just because People that are behind the scenes want to stay behind the scenes. They don't really want to engage. You know, that's what I kind of found. So with the, the musician types that I've, I try to have on, I really try to curate it so that I'm talking to musicians that are going after it. Like I want, I want to talk to the potentially the musicians that are going to be the next like Brandy Carlisle, Macklemore, you know, Head in the Heart, whatever, all the ones that broke out of the scene. You know, I want to, those are hope, who I hope that I'll get on the, the podcast. So if I'm doing my job as curating it, then that answer to the question that you just asked tends to be very similar. It right. tends to be, I want to do this for a living. I want to go after it. Every once in a while, there's musicians that are friends of mine or like people that I dig that I already know they're not really trying to break out. They're just kind of doing their thing, staying local. So then I get the other answer of, you know, I just do it for fun kind of, you know, or, some variation of that you know like i just do it on the side or whatever but yeah so so it's pretty typical that i get that kind of you know let's go kind of answer um and then you know my conversation is essentially trying to figure out how everybody that's going after it how they're deciding to do it because there's a lot of different ways to kind of get, have success or try to have success um and there's a lot of different philosophies around it that i'm trying to discover through the, the conversations that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, so, yeah, you did art 
podcast with, with me and Brielle 2018 and 11 episodes after that you stopped doing the podcast for about a year or so uh you brought it back this April uh I'm guessing you kind of brought it back among the pandemic where musicians they didn't have any outlet but what made you stop in the first place and was that the main reason you wanted to bring it back yeah okay those are good questions because um there's uh, very specific answers for both of them. Stopping was, I just got overwhelmed with, so I really, really desperately wanted to continue the podcast from leaving Seattle to move. I moved to San Diego um, in 2017. Basically January 1st was when I landed in San Diego. Um, I hustled hard to make it continue for about two. Um, so I, you said I stopped in 18? Uh, like I think January or February, 2019. 2019. So yeah, the yeah. first, those first two years, I was hustling pretty hard, you know, flying back to Seattle whenever I could financially kind of do it. Um, I wasn't really necessarily being that wise about my financial, like long-term, you know, kind of position because it wasn't sustainable, but I was doing it anyway. I was just like trying to make it happen. So I'd, I'd go back to Seattle every so often for various reasons. Sometimes it was like uh, piggybacked on some other reason I was in Seattle. Um, and then I would record like 13 or so episodes within a week. Like I just, oh, wow. you know, crank them out, go to get, try to line them up and crank them out two a day sometimes and just go driving all around trying to make it happen. So I did that. Um, and then money ran out. And so I kind of had to switch my gears, but then I also discovered Skype. I, I did my first like Skype, um, you know, podcast, but I totally didn't know how to do it the real way. I, uh, or was it, no, no, I did my, before I did my first Skype one, I think I just called somebody. I think it was, uh, the first, who was the first person you had on this? It was, um, Oh, Jason McHugh. Yeah. So he was my first, um, kind of non in-person interview and I just had him on my phone and I angled my mic onto the phone oh, right. and just, and just kind of like had it work out that way. And, and then like, I think the next one, I finally figured out how to use Skype and how to do it more legit style. But, um, but I've been working under that. So I started to do kind of that type and maybe in, I can't remember the timeline exactly, but maybe in between there, I kind of changed the format for a while where I was just doing these, what I call Watts radios where they're, playing songs from the scene. So I did these things called local show preview show is what I called it. And I, I just looked, I looked on the schedule, like, I don't know how far in advance, but maybe a week or a month in advance to what was going to happen in the Seattle music community on like the strange, all the places that they, they list where the shows are happening. So I just scanned them and, and tried to find shows that looked interesting that were kind of underground, mostly local, um, but had some element of a gateway into I could secure that it was going to be a good show. So I was trying to preview these shows for people because the, I don't know, the one thing when I asked the audience, like people that have been on it and, and, and I guess, yeah, I guess people have been on it. The one, one of the main questions going back to your first answer of like common, common answers is more people at shows was always like a common answer. People said they want more people to come out to shows. And it's like, well, how can I help facilitate that? And what I think I realize about our current age of, of the internet and what's going on, people, you know, discover online before they go out, they don't discover out in the clubs anymore. So I was trying to present like a, an option, like that you could listen to this, this podcast, here's, hopefully here's some great music, but then also go like, oh, this is an actual live show that's coming up with these three or four bands that I just listened to. And then I can make a determination whether or not I wanna go see them in person. So I was trying to help the scene in that way. Um, and so I did that for a while where I made these kind of like radio shows that were go upcoming live shows. Um, and then it just kind of got hard. I think and then after that, I think I went back to doing some interviews and then it just got difficult with trying to survive. I was driving Lyft and Uber for my job. And that just was just really difficult to make any good money on. So that was hard. And just, I don't know, life caught up to me. And I, I did one at the beginning of 2019 and stopped. It just kind of just stopped because I was like, I think I was heading into grad school. I don't know. Life got hard. Basically, the bottom line is life got hard. Um, right. And was, I imagine it's hard to... Yeah, keep keep your pulse on the Seattle music scene while you're yeah, and two two states away from it. Um, sort of not 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 as I don't think not as difficult. The the only thing that I don't get to do is go out because like I was the type to actually go to shows and discover like if my friend if somebody I knew a band I knew was playing a show 
and I was like, I want to see them. I always made an active effort to show up when the actual show started and leave basically when the show ended. Um, let's say my friend's band was first in the lineup. So I would watch them. I like, you know, I like them, I support them. I would watch the second band. And if they sucked, I would just go outside or leave the room for a while and then come back for the last band and give them a couple songs. And if they sucked, I would leave at that point. But if, you know, I gave them a chance, basically. I gave the whole show a chance and find out a way, even if my, the band that I was going for was the first or last, you know, I would, I would go, okay, what time does the whole show start? Let me go and try to discover something new. And I, I did it. I can't recall off the top of my head, which bands, like, I was like, oh my God, this is my new favorite band because I'd never heard it before. But, um, but sometimes things like that would happen. Um, so, but that's the only thing that really I couldn't do because my, you know, building up this network that I built up while I'm in the scene and I was pretty active with it, uh, taught me how to use the internet to discover what's news going on. Like I'm friends with the Nana Mucho crew and they're pretty good at keeping a pulse on what's going on in the underground. Patrick Galactic, um, he's doing his new thing called Weird at Night, which is also another way to access some of what's going on in the scene. Obviously there's just the big hitters like Stranger, KXP and all that stuff that, you know, they got, they present their version of what's going on in the scene. So I, and then when something new comes up, another new outlet, I'm one of the first to learn about like um, sessions in place is another kind of new outlet um, because of the pandemic. So, you know, because of that, what I've built already, it keeps me pretty informed about what's going on in the community and the scene. So I feel pretty confident that way. And then, and so all I got to do is sit down if I really want to discover what's going on, just go through my Facebook and the networks I've established and go like, Oh, that's, that's a person I haven't seen before. Let me dig in. Let me go find their band camp or play them on Apple music or whatever and see what they're all about. Um, but yeah, so I feel pretty confident that I, I still stay pretty informed, but obviously I'm not physically there. So there's, one element that i can't access well yeah you're not missing too much right now not being able to play shows and that kind of thing so the internet curation is the thing so yeah you've yeah. kept up with it um, yeah exactly did, did you move to san diego for your master's degree is that what brought you down there no no there was one other question in that first question that i didn't answer but i can't remember it was when when i was talking about why i quit um did i answer both there was two questions there Oh, uh, and why, what, why it came back? Was it because well, of I, the COVID? Yeah. And wanted so, to like support the people who now don't have as many outlets. Do you want me to answer that one? Cause I, there, I want to answer that eventually. Go, go um, for it. Let, let's okay. do it before we forget. Okay. Let's I, see I, I got one. all my answers here, so I won't forget our, our train of thought. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's come back to that question. You just yeah, asked yeah. me, but, but why did I start up again? Um, I think that's pretty a good, uh, thing to talk about because, um, yeah, pandemic related had a big, um, reason for starting back up, you know, I wanted to, I was like, sort of had more time again, because I was, I'm a graduate student in school, we got kicked off campus, there was kind of, it was kind of getting into summer, I had enough kind of money to kind of hang me out. So I didn't have to like, work, like, and then it was kind of hard to work because of the pandemic. Anyway, like, it was just all weird. So but I had this like, more space again. And the pandemic presented an opportunity like I wanted to find out like, well, how was the Seattle, the Northwest music community dealing with um, reacting to um, responding to this moment we're in. And so I thought it would be a good uh, con potential conversation to, to document this kind of time we're in as in the, in the, through the lens of the Seattle and Northwest music community. So that was like a big reason why I started back up again. And I was feeling more comfortable with doing this online remote kind of thing and learning zoom was another thing. Like I, because I took all these Zoom classes, like classes at school through Zoom, I was starting to feel really comfortable and I felt like it was a good platform to start recording again through. Um, and so, yeah, so it was just really wanting to document the, what was going on. And I never wanted Word on the Street to die. Like it was never my goal for it to go away, even though it made it look like it, it slowed down and stopped. Um, it was still always in a, a, a goal of mine to keep it going because it's like I spent too much time on it to let it just kind of die, you know? It's like, I'm kind of proud of it and I'm kind of like, um, I don't know, can't think of the right word, but I'm kind of like, uh, not addicted is not the right word, but you know, there's like a compulsion to, to collect these stories and be, you know, part of the community still. Um, in is some it way. also what you're best known for? Like of all the things you do, visual art, YouTube, or like 
Do, do you know what, what people best know you for, your audience? Do, do you know what that is? Yeah, it, it really varies on when you met me <laughs> and how right. long you've known me. Because, so like, this is a good um, question or a good example to answer this question is like, I play the saxophone okay. and there's like so many, nobody, like 90% yeah. of the Seattle music community now has no idea I play the saxophone. But through high school up to the, when I first entered the Seattle music community, that's what I was known for most. And then, so like, if you knew me from high school, that's assumed what you, you knew me as. I got in the, I started, you know, within the last 10 years, I started like playing guitar and singing and rapping and doing something else. So then I was like on stage, I was known for that. And then of course there's the podcast where there's, there are still people in the community that had no idea I even performed. They think I, all I do is podcast. So it's like, it just depends on where you met me first. And so there really isn't one answer to that. And then the visual art thing, I don't know. That's always been, I guess if you knew me as a, so I went to the university of Washington, my undergrad and got um, my degree in fiber arts. So if you knew me from there, you probably might assume that I'm more of a visual artist than a musician. I, yeah. So, well, but let's do the inverse of that question. So, okay. it, so what do you most want to be like your, your artistic persona? What is there something you want to be at the forefront if you had control over what people see you as first? Yeah, no, that's a um, great question. Cause uh, like the way I introduced myself, I, I'm pretty sure I mentioned like this idea of being a creative or creator. Yeah. Um, that's, I don't like to define myself as any one particular type of creativity. If somebody knows me, I just want them to know me as a creative person and somebody that has good ideas, you know, or I like that answer. That's what I want to be known as. Cause I love to play music. I love to play, like I'm passionate about music. I love making art, but it's like, I'd say music is more of a passion. Art is the thing that I can do that I'm just good at. Like I was raised by a a carpenter and somebody that worked with their hands. So I just kind of learned it through that, that in a lot of ways, but yeah, just being creative in general. I just love to just make things and do things and be, be a part of things too. Like, um, even if I'm not the one that's creating it, like if I can support other, that's kind of what the podcast is about too. It's like, if I can support a community or an idea, um, that's doing cool stuff, just being around it, it makes me feel good, you know? So totally. Uh, well, let's talk about your music a little bit because the I, I I've listened to a little bit of your music and it's uh, I think every release I've heard so far is with A Rock. Um, okay. So is is he still in Seattle? Yeah, he's still in Seattle. Um, we talk sometimes. We have I've been a bad friend, but uh, <laughs> haven't connected as often as I feel like I should with him. When I first moved down here, we were talking a lot. You know, like mm-hmm. every month or so, we we'd kind of connect and stuff. But the last year, I'd say every six months, we kind of talk, you know, get on the boat to talk. But I had, that was another thing I had really wanted to try to maintain work. Uh, so that's the Zim and A-Rock, like you said, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to maintain that band, even though we weren't um, together. And when I f- first moved to San Diego, I was trying to write music for the band and it got kind of weird. And I think there was a moment where I said to A-Rock, Hey, look, I'm just going to focus on writing solo music. And he was like, no, whatever, dude. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> He's super chill. But like, um, so when I first moved to San Diego, I had this goal of writing one, like writing and like writing, recording and publishing one song a month through like, that was my goal. Like I was hoping to do that forever. Um, but it didn't quite work out. I ended up writing within 2017. I wrote, um, eight songs. And just a few days ago, I got the final master back on like two of them. So it's taken a long time. We're in 2020 now. That was 2017. So these songs have taken a long time, you know, because of money and just a lot of different reasons, time, you know, all these different kind of reasons that kind of fluctuated. But so the answer, the short answer to your question is no. Um, The Zim and A-Rock isn't the only thing that is my musical outlet. It's like, solo music as well. So I use the Zim and A-Rock like Bandcamp page. It's, but on that Bandcamp page, there's certain ones that are only me um, as well. Um, and just, I don't know, I say that maybe uh, within the last six years, there's probably been a few more releases from the Zim and A-Rock than just the Zim solo. But because it's been such a long time, it's really hard to know 
where the priority is in that way. But right now we're obviously not performing or playing because we're living in different cities and yeah. all that stuff. But I don't know. Did that answer your question? It does. Yeah. And and I understand that whole like uh the the branding like so solo versus band things cuz we we'll, we'll have a song coming out in a couple weeks here that is a high crime song even though it's just kind of a demo that I made by myself and the others didn't play on. Yeah. But it it made sense it it fit more as a high crime song than a solo song so it's kind of you run it by the others and if they sign off on it then yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with me it was easy because um so, well, I'm going to ask you a question in a second, but yeah. with the Zim and A-Rock, just two people. Plus, right. A-Rock was primarily a role player. He played drums. And, um, and like, I wrote everything, pretty much arranged everything. But I really, whenever I brought a song, I would really honestly want his opinion about it. So we would work together on how to kind of, you know, formulate it or kind of move it to a direction that it worked for a live performance and different things, but it was really, really heavy. Like my responsibility was pretty high on making sure everything worked out um, and the you know writing of the songs and things like that. So, so, so it made it easier, but like is high crime. So I, is there more than just you and Bri how do you pronounce her name? Uh, Brielle. 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 Uh, is it more than just you two right now? Or is there? So we're, we're a four piece band, but me and Brielle are, we, we call ourselves the co-captains. We're the okay. two, the two songwriters, the band leaders, the people in charge of the project. Um, most songs are her and I trying to write like 50, 50, where we'll, we're working ideas together. There are some songs that's just her. Well, she'll kind of come up with the chords and lyrics there are some songs where it's just me but we try to make it both of us mm -hmm. um and then and then we have cody on drums and jesse on bass and they're kind of the, the a rock in that situation where we bring them the skeletons of the song but we rely on them to challenge us and try to bring out the best of that piece uh and we have those people because they're 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 our friends they're fun to play with but also they're better at their jobs than us we we have a dedicated yeah. drummer because i if me and brielle try to write and record our own drum parts they wouldn't be as good so if we bring in a rhythm idea to cody here's the song we have written it's 70 percent done he can be like well this if i'm playing this this is the same thing for two minutes here's some opportunities where we can change the vibe or add dynamics and that's what I want out of all my bandmates or collaborators to kind of, yeah. and, and same with Brielle, where I'll bring her a song that I have. She's like, I like the, this verse, but the chorus is a little boring. You need to add a change here. And I'm like, God damn it. Because that's, that's <laughs> more, that's more work I have to do. Because yeah. I'm like, no, I think it's fine. And then she's like, no, it's not good enough. So yeah. I really like having the, the other band members to kind of help make the songs better. Pu yeah. push me where i'm pretty motivated but i you get to a point where you sign off as it being done but unless the other sign off on it being done you're not done yeah yeah <laughs> let's I go can, back to the i can see that yeah let's go back to the question uh, we, we kind of skipped over uh sure. why did you move to san diego if not just for your graduate program oh yeah i didn't even know i was going to go to graduate school when i first moved here um i was actually before I moved, I went to Seattle University. I was considering going to graduate school for therapy, actually. Um, Which wasn't what your undergrad was in, you said. No. Yeah, so fi it, fiber arts. Yeah. So I was just, honestly, I was really looking for a way to get out of my job. <laughs> I was kind of tired of my day job. And I was like, I wanted to find a way to not just have to get another similar day job. I was like, how can I kind of elevate or just change things up. So going back to school was kind of my answer to that. But if I went back to therapy for therapy, there would have been like a year of prerequisites I needed to fulfill, um, like going to community college. So I didn't know how that was going to work. But during that whole process, I learned that my ex-wife wanted to move to San Diego. Um, I won't get into the, the long story about that, but um, she wanted to move down here. It eventually worked out that I just was like, well, I was kind of like, it was, I had to do some soul searching because I, I didn't want to, I didn't want my, didn't really didn't want my kids to move. Um, but, and at the same time, I knew I was ready for change. I was ready to do kind of like a leap of faith and just kind of go not fight it too much and go, all right, let's, let's all move. Then if you want to move, you have your reasons. I get it. 
I want to, you know, I'll just move to and we'll work it out. We'll figure out what, how to make it happen. All work. And so that was the main reason was because my kids were moving down here and I was not into the idea of the like summers in Seattle winters, you know, like I didn't want to be away from them right. for really long periods of time. And I never felt really confident about my financial situation that I would be able to like fly down like every other week or fly them up. You know, it's just like the money, the amount of money that would cost to make that happen all the time, just didn't seem realistic to me. Um, and I wasn't interested in any way. I wanted to be around them um, on the regular, which is like, this is the number one thing I'm most like frustrated about with this pandemic is I actually don't get to see them right now. They're at their oh, mom, really? which is like 40 minutes away because my mom lives with me and she's like 70. So there's like a high risk factor with the whole COVID thing. And I'm pretty anxious about medical stuff regardless and that getting sick and all that stuff. So they, and then they're kind of, um, there's a lot of little factors about not, we're not able to keep the network cl as closed as I would feel comfortable about. If we, for a while we were transferring the kids between the houses, um, but we were maintaining this kind of closed network, you know, it was like, but now they go to school where they go to in-person classes every once in a while. They, their mom has, seems to, have reasons for them to do other things every once in a while right now not so much because it got so bad again but a yeah. few months like a month and a half ago it kind of was like um different and i just didn't feel comfortable so and then when the pandemic so i got kicked off campus um what J november what was it march 12th of you know earlier this year and when that first happened i didn't see them for like three months then we decided to try to make this closed network and then it got weird again and they were starting back up school, all these different things. I was like, you know, I don't feel comfortable with it. So anyways, that's a tangent on that whole thing, but yeah. Well, it's a so, lot of compounded stress on stress on stress. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's yeah. So, so yeah, that's the main reason I'm in San Diego was for my kids. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. But you moved down there and now you're uh, doing this big kind of group graduate program. How is that? The, the further education in arts, how has that impacted your art? Well, wow. Yeah. Um, my visual art. So like, because so visual art wise, I always, I have this little saying or this idea, like I have a hard time with anybody that kind of defines themselves as something and doesn't, isn't actually doing the thing. Like there's a lot of people that maybe call themselves a musician or artist of some degree but they haven't done it for years. You know, they're like, whatever reason they work, family, other things. I mean, there's a variety of reasons why, but while I was in Seattle, like I really valued. So I was focused on music. I was focused on everything music. You know, the, there was the podcast was a direct correlation to music. And even my starting my YouTube channel was a direct correlation to music. So like music was the priority, but I, I still valued calling myself like a, artist in the sense of making things like a art, artist that makes artifacts, you know, like, and so I was like, well, I want to maintain this idea. So how can I do that? So I started making or doing more of these things I call tunnel books, these little books. I saw those books. and, and yes. you have them up on your Etsy for people who uh, want to, uh, or one of your Etsy's you have a few yeah. different <laughs> yeah. ones. Yeah. I'm, I'm all over the place, but yeah. yeah. So, so the they're really books. cool. People should check them out. Did you can see Thanks, demonstrations man. of them on your YouTube page and the, I, yeah, go to the YouTube first. Cause I think you can see the three dimension effect better than just the still pictures. They're really cool. Yeah, yeah. I, got a, I got a story about that. Don't, don't let me forget. I want to tell a story about the YouTube and the tunnel books, but you asked me how going to grad school has affected right. my um, art making. So basically the, the short version of what I was doing up till getting into grad school was just, just trying to think, just trying to stay active. You know, I wasn't really putting a lot of thought into the, the art I was making or anything like that. I wasn't trying to be profound, but going into grad school and doing visual art there, there's a stress on concept conceptual aspect of it as being a grad student, they really want you to have a reason for making your art. And so the first year I was pretty lost. I didn't really know because I wasn't used to that. I was trying to figure that out. Um, but because of the pandemic, because of social justice stuff um, that has happened because of the election, it's really 
all these factors kind of uh, aligned in a way that, and grad school all aligned in a way that it was like, okay, we're in this pretty profound moment in our history as a society. Um, this is great content. This is great things that I'm actually interested in that I could start using in my artwork. And it brings my artwork to a, a conceptual level that's beyond just making art for fun, you know? So that's, that's a big evolution in my art making process is I'm still very much in the middle of it. Like I, I don't feel confident in saying like, this is what my art is about yet because I'm, I'm in that process of doing it, but there is very much ev evidence and, um, and a desire to reflect and respond to the things I just mentioned, the pandemic, social justice, and like politics, mostly surrounding the election. Um, and so I've been doing, using a lot of that in my artwork. So that's how it's changed the most is there's actually like a hopeful deep, deeper meanings within my art that, um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's always been some degree of deeper meaning, but this is just different. It's a little more, hopefully, hopefully more profound in a way, but I don't know. I can definitely see that. And that seems to be a theme, not just among your visual art, but your art as, as a whole, that it's about elevating others. So with this recent visual art, it's elevating black voices or promoting anti-racism, social justice. Um, yeah. But like even your, your podcast, you want to talk about other people and kind of bring their voices to the forefront. That seems to be a recurring thing about wanting to, yeah, get others' messages out there. Yeah, and it was very... It was interesting. It was hard to figure out the, um, I guess, empathetic. I don't know the right way to say it. It was hard to figure out the right way to allow or allow word on the street in particular to, to be a platform to um, elevate like basically black voices in our community Yeah. without it looking like I was just trying to be an opportunist. You know, um, that was, that's not my goal. Um, it's really, I, and even with my art in general, my visual, everything I do, I don't want to come across as an opportunist. I want to come across as an ally. And how do you do that? Um, and, you know, especially right during like, during when George Floyd was murdered, there was a lot of people, a lot of black voices posting, like, don't ask another black person what you can do. You know, it's like, don't ask another, you know, there was like that kind of, that kind of, um, well, what do they mean by that? I'm confused by that, to be honest, because they're, my... get, because they're getting bombarded. Like every, like the black community was getting bombarded with what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? You know, it's like, you need to like self-reflect, do the research, but don't go to your friend and say, you know, Oh, I see. Yeah. You're, you're one black for, you know what I mean? Don't go you, to your, you, you don't, don't want the shortcut. You got to put in the work to yeah. see. Yeah. How you can be helpful. I, yeah. I, I totally I get the, that. Yeah. But there's also the whole idea of, um, yeah, uh, you, you being conflicted on how to present that message where like you and me were, we're white dudes and we don't want to just put our message out there. We want to, the, the thing I struggle with at the beginning of all that was like, if if I stay more quiet, that gives more room for black voices to make them. I don't want to compete with with black voices. I want to try yeah, to work to yeah. make theirs bigger. Yeah, I was I was I was um, struggling with that same thing. So like I had so a, a great example of that for me was I had planned to do this live stream. Like when we were all kind of gearing up, and people were already doing these live stream kind of performances, live stream ideas because of the pandemic. Yeah, it's like you know I have a theory like i don't think a lot of the music community actually ever put the right amount of energy into figuring out the right way to do it there's a few people that have been doing good live stream stuff like sessions in place like we They're mentioned so already. Good. yeah yeah those are like the top those are like the high bar but there's you know there's others that you don't have to be that <laughs> you know that that you know good about it but 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 there's a lot of people that are just throwing their phone up and then calling it a live stream and not in just like as like, why aren't people treating this like a real show? Why aren't they promoting it? Why aren't they putting out event pages? Why aren't they going like making it an event like you should be doing with every show you're doing? But anyways, so I was trying to do that. I was like, okay, I got this event I was planning on. And then it turned out it, it coincided pretty much exactly with, there was two things that happened. Um, the kind of blackout Tuesday that happened, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I was, I had a, I had scheduled a podcast to record with another white uh, artist 
And so I was like, you know, this doesn't feel right to do this right now with you. So I'm let's, can we put it off, you know, a little while? And she, she was like, yeah, totally. Um, and then my live stream that I was planning was on the same day as the George Floyd Memorial. And I was like, well, I'm not going to, I don't need to be another, you know, this is more important than what I'm doing. So it's like, so there was that conflict, not, I don't know if it was really a conflict because it wasn't really, it was like, yeah, obviously get, get out of the way, Zim, you know? And, and so I was processing that whole thing. And then within that, as I was processing and figuring out when is it, when's the right time to then start being a voice again? The, what I attached myself to was the idea of if you, that kind of, I don't, it's, I don't know the direct quote, it's a Desmond Tutti quote, but it's something along the lines of, if you are silent in the face of oppression, you side with the oppressor. Right. So I was like, well, then that, that's allowing me access back into being a voice. You know, I want to invite, you know, especially people of color, black voices on the word on the street podcast. I want to keep talking about how I believe things are try because really when it talks about racism, especially it's a white person's problem. White people have to talk to other white people. Black people can talk all they, they can, uh, they can inform <laughs> us about yeah. what they're feeling and what's going on, but it's up to white people to, to make the change, to, to, to confront other white people, to be anti-racist you know it's like and so it's like trying to find my voice and going like you know we we're all necessary in this fight in this kind of you know every voice is required you know it's just just finding out the roles that you're it's appropriate for you to play um is important so that's really well said um yeah let's talk about your youtube channel we 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 passed we br briefly mentioned it yeah, yeah. um yeah so, you've been yeah go ahead I'll start. So well, I'll start with the story I was going to tell about the tunnel book because it's related to YouTube. So I'll start. So a few months ago, I don't know how long it's been now, but a few, I'll just say a few months ago, I had um, this, this Brazilian YouTuber um, found one of my tunnel book videos. And then in her, she does like these vloggy type things in her and she does a lot of craft stuff and like artist stuff. So she found my YouTube video and then followed along on how to make a tunnel book based on that YouTube video and shared it with her network. And for like months, a couple months afterward, I was getting tons of like Brazilian, like Portuguese comments on my YouTube, <laughs> on that video and other things. And then like somehow I shared something or something got shared on Instagram. And like, and then again, I got all these like people from Brazil following my channel on Instagram. So it was this, this kind of crazy, really cool, awesome moment of the thing that you hope happens with anything you're making that a, a bigger creator will kind of find you and go like, or some kind of actual influencer will find what you're making, share it with their community. And then it, it kind of grows your channel in some way or another. So yeah. That, let, let's, let, let's stay on that a bit because so yeah. Yeah, there's a gatekeeper, if you can call them. It, fl the floodgates open and your work is starting to be seen by a lot more people in an international community that you weren't reaching before. Uh, what do you do mentally? Then? Is it just, yay, this is cool? Or are you trying to capitalize on that in some way? Think this happened, now I can try to do this? Yeah, no, I was trying to work it as hard as I could. Yeah. I was like, I was going for not only in the comments, like the things that I was doing, the comments, I would go to Google Translate and translate all their comments and respond and then do a response, Google Translate it into <laughs> Portuguese, respond to them so I could keep, it wasn't just like, oh, I don't understand what this is. I yeah, was you actually, want to engage with them, right? Yeah, I was trying to engage with the audience to try to help, you know, just let them know, like, whatever, who knows what will happen. So that was one thing. Um, doing like an actual, like, you know, thank you to the person that did this. Her, her channel is called Flamingo, Flamingos, I think flamingos yeah it's like it's not like the bird flamingos but it's something like that okay. i don't know i can't remember exactly but um but yeah so i was just looking for opportunities and that's how the instagram thing came about i think i um she like she she would like she made a tunnel book and then i don't know shared shared it or something but then i like made another tunnel book and tagged her and said thank you and then she shared that post and then it's like so i was really looking for ways to kind of milk it without going overboard like it's an example like with the podcast like um when i have a guest on the podcast i tag them once on every platform and then 
done. Like I, I don't go months later, tag them again, a couple months later, tag them again or anything like that. It's like, I try to be really respectful about that kind of n- don't going overboard. So yeah, I was just trying to like do what I felt like was a respectful, responsible way of taking advantage of the situation as much as I could. Yeah. Gratitude and appreciation. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you do a lot of other things on your YouTube channel. You've been doing it, I think, 2007 It is the official launch on there. I, and I yeah. know it was just then it was just like fan videos of like concerts you would see or uh, whatever it was at the time. But there's unboxing and review videos. You have your art uploads. There's some life blogging. You are doing all the kind of commentary on Lyft versus Uber uh, experience. What What's the goal of the YouTube channel right now? Right. It's, it's so- evolved a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I, so I feel like the best way to do YouTube, right. Is to pick a thing (laughs) right, and and go. And I never did that. I, so too many interests. It doesn't fit you. Well, (laughs) so I guess, but I kind of wanted, which is not good advice. This is not good advice, but I kind of wanted to, well, I wanted to jump over I wanted m- my personality to be the thing that carried it, but nobody mm. cares about you until you've established that thing. You know, either either you you've wrote, written a song that everybody loves, you do a YouTube channel that's about you know tech or whatever that everybody lo- they're coming for the tech. You grow your channel, then all of a sudden you 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 can flip, you break over to like the personality because people then it's like you've, you've, you've built your audience so much that people are actually more interested in finding out who you are more than about what you're talking, you know, like what that thing it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never, I never, I'm not even close to that yet. Cause I've never established that thing. That's really grown my audience um, to a place that people are interested in my personality and just what I have to say on random topics. So I kind of jumped over that and just was like talking kind of about just random stuff um, too soon. And I didn't realize it really at the time because you said 2007. Yeah, I did maybe start the channel then in terms of actually like activating it. But I consider 2014 the actual start of the channel because that makes at, sense. That, at that time, I started doing what I called video journals. And so I was really, you know, just trying to figure out a way to get my music out to more people. And, and you know, people were having success. I was, if I did the video journals like in 2017 or 2007, I probably would have more, you know, it would have probably done what I thought it could do at 2014. But the idea was just to kind of, you know, do these journals, talk about the process and stuff. But it was already at that time, YouTube was already pretty saturated with people that had already done that. And so they were looking for something different regardless. And, and then, yeah, it's just a confusing thing. So what is my YouTube channel? The, the main question um, it's, it's, it's definitely kind of like a lifestyle channel because I do a, just kind of everything, whatever is kind of happening. Um, but there's a focus right now on trying to use it as something that I use as a platform to share my artwork, um, to kind of talk about my artwork, but also making like there's pieces on there right now. There's the there's a piece called Made in America. There's a piece called Brianna. There's um, a piece called. Um, it'll all work out, which are pieces that were made for the platform, but I consider them work, they're art, they're pieces of art. They're not just like a YouTube video They're So I don't know. Yeah. They, they can be standalone pieces that yeah. aren't. Yeah. And so that's what I'm kind of trying to do as well as like just the other day or last night, I don't know when this is going to publish, but the other day I published a kind of an update of what's going on. I have this, so I have MFA Chronicles podcast, and then I have an MFA Chronicles on YouTube, which are basically two separate things. I'm, I'm dumb like that. And I use the same title for multiple things, but like, but MFA Chronicles on YouTube is, is like a talking head usually about wh- what it's like being a graduate student at San Diego State University. I talk about the things that I like about it, the things I don't like about it. Like the last one I just did was I talked about kind of a, a, a slice of what the financial aid process was like and some, you know, things that happened. So it kind of gives you a, a window into what things hap- could happen to you if you decide to become a graduate student or go to school for your MFA. Hopefully it's kind of as it transcends just being at San Diego State University. Like that was the kind of idea. Like I'll start this like documentation of my journey as an MFA student and maybe there'll be other people out there that are considering it or into it, but it really, 
didn't really happen. And I, I guess it's too niche of a, of a subject. Like just prior to that, I was doing, like you said, the ride share stuff with Lyft and Uber. And that actually got me like people, I would put out an episode and every episode I would get comments. I would get people who would actually interact. I, that helped grow my channel past that thousand subscriber point. Cause I was, I was in that flux zone. I don't know if you know what happened with YouTube, but there was a time when you didn't have their, the, the criteria you needed to be monetized. You could just monetize like right away. Um, and so I was monetized and I only had like 500 followers on the channel or whatever subscribers. But then at about that point, when I was about that point, they changed it. So I got demonetized. My channel got demonetized, but it only took like two months to get that other 500 because of that rideshare show. So that really helped get me past that thousand subscriber threshold. And then, you know, the rest is history in a way. But so, yeah, really, my channel is just r still pretty random, but it's focused on creative stuff. And I'm trying to figure out a way like I've seen like so I'm doing a lot more like portrait paintings and kind of ink these paint, I'll just call them paintings. Um, and I'm trying to do these high lapse things. And I've seen like pick like other YouTube videos of like people making paintings that get like millions of views. So I'm like, right, it's a popular format and there's a lot of competition with that yeah. niche, I'm sure. So hopefully maybe I can make one eventually that just hits the stream that I call, I call the YouTube like there's a stream, there's like this river in the center of YouTube that most of us small creators live way on the outskirts of. Yeah. And every once in a while, maybe we can get one of our videos to get in that stream and it just kind of like goes. And so that's kind of my mental I love visual, that. Yeah. visual of it. But um, but maybe one of my videos eventually will hit that stream and go. And, and kind of because I've done so many um, videos, you know, there's like over 700 videos on the channel. Right. It's just like, I'm like, death by a thousand cuts with it more than than like having that one thing that's just gone it's like i just have so many videos that all of them get a few views here or there so i actually make a couple bucks like i just got another deposit from youtube the other day it's yeah you amass a couple hundred thousand views over those 700 yeah. something videos yeah so yeah, yeah. The, the, there's uh yeah some, some pride to be shown and yeah a lot of people have seen your stuff but it's yeah bit bit by bit by bit kind of yeah but when when you look back at like an old video maybe you posted in 2014 this old content uh how, how do you think you have a person or you as a creative person have changed did you um, do wince of that or are you proud of past work uh i'm i'm i, I don't know if i i could define myself as a narcissist but i have narcissistic tendencies you know you, you should yeah i got i got over so the way I can answer that kind of is like, you know how a lot of musicians, when they first started getting into it and recording and they like hear their voice or whatever, and they, people, they really react strongly to hearing their own voice again in the headphones, you know, after they've recorded something, they're like, oh my gosh, that's what I sound like. I got over that like within a day, you know? So that's kind of like the whole idea with YouTube as well. Like, um, and other ideas, like there's definitely like early on just, the, the, the relationship of talking to a camera and, and making it feel somewhat natural was, it took a while. It, I was very self-conscious of like sitting and talk. Cause I didn't know who, like you, you always have this, I don't know. There was always, there's this like filter or friction between the idea of feeling natural about it because you just don't know. But then eventually you just uh, kind of basically assume that people are watching it. You, you assume you're talking to somebody. So it, it starts to like get easier and then, and then, so that, that element of things, but as, I don't know if as an artist, it's more about the process that's changed a little bit and the comfortableness that's changed a little over time uh, with the medium, with the platform. But I don't think it's fundamentally changed me as an artist in any way. I still feel like I'm the same creative person and artist. Um, even, that's cool. Yeah, There's yeah. a through line through it all. It's not, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd love to see what you brought for show and tell. Oh, okay. We're, we're ready for show and tell. Cool. Yeah. So like, I didn't bring all of them, but I just thought I'd bring, I don't know which one to start with, but, um, I'm a, I, I held on to all my, um, classic generation one transformers. All right. These so, are awesome. So this is ultra Magnus. Um, he was kind of at the time. So I don't know, I was, you know, early teenager probably when I got this or I don't remember how old, 
you know, I was when I got this. I, this is the only one I actually still have the box for, but obviously it's out of the box. It's not like it was, I kept it in the box, mm-hmm. but in the box is like in tatter. So it's not like a, it's not like worth anything. It's like, but I still have the box. That's the point I'm trying to make. But, um, but I just hung on to my transformers, um, throughout the years. And this was like the one that I was the most kind of proud of at the time, because it was like a kind of a, one of the bigger ones. And it was, um, cause my parents growing up, we weren't really that, um, I don't know, affluent, I would say. Mm-hmm. And so I would get the, you know, you know, GI Joe's or transformers or whatever. Um, you know, I would get the figures, oh, but I right. wouldn't get the, I wouldn't get the vehicles like for GI Joe's because they were so much more expensive, but the figures, you know, that you could afford. But I think that may be one reason why I got into transformers was because, um, so this is Jetfire. You know, yeah. So, so this one and the last one, do they also trend like you? You can bend the pieces into cars or spaceships. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. I'm not. I can't. I'm not gonna do it because they are so brittle and fragile and hard to do anymore to transform. Oh, I so I don't want to, you know, be in the setting and trying to do. I'm not really. I, like, I, I won't make you show it off at risk of hurting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're already like one of the arms on this one's already broken and like. Oh, there's I see. A piece, there's a piece back here, and the the ones I have on my shelf, I have a bunch on my shelf that are. I this this is the form you want to show it off in. Yeah, right now yeah. it just happens. That's what they're in right now. Um, but yeah, so I just I just love my transformers. I I held on to them, and through the years I've kind of collected more, um, and gotten gifts like A Rock, my drummer that we talked about earlier. He gave me um Optimus Prime. Cool. He's missing a fist, but like so I've collected more as time has gone on, but um. But yeah, where, so that, where, that's, where are they normally displayed? If, if you didn't bring them out for, sh- are they on a, a a shelf somewhere, like by your computer? Where, where do they yeah, hang out? Yeah, just right above me here. Um, there's a bunch of them. I I can't like my com- sure. camera is attached to my computer, so I can't really um, show you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I have maybe like thirty. I'll grab a. Oh, I wanted to show this one too. So like, I have a bunch of the smaller ones as well. I have a uh, Ravage the tape. If you remember cool. this one, I can transform for you because it's a little bit a <laughs> little bit easier to do but you know he transformed into the tape were you ever into transformers i was i really like uh like my, my thing like this i still have all my dragon ball z action figures and there's a, mostly dragon ball z but a couple other little things like that but yeah so i you know i don't know i'll grab a couple more my, my legos i still have all my legos but a, a lot we, we gave away a lot of my precious childhood things in garage sales Insecticon. Oh, oh, nice. I think this guy's Brawl. Brawl? Brawl, maybe? Huffer. No, know. or maybe Huffer. Huffer. He was like a sem- little semi truck. I can, he's one of the, like the mini bots. If you remember, um, oh, okay. So I, 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 I didn't even, I didn't even see the Shia LaBeouf movies with, with the Transformers. So I'm oh. unfortunately pretty, pretty ignorant of it. Sorry. The only one that's worth watching is the first one. The first uh-huh. one's de- the first one is decent. All the rest of them suck balls. Is it still like an ongoing series where they're still making new episodes or, well, or is it all just hashing out stuff from the eighties and nineties? The universe is still like the last episode essentially of the Transformers universe was Bumblebee, mm-hmm. which was, I was really hopeful for because in the previews, they, um, they showed, so movies is another thing I'm really into, but yeah. um, they showed, um, like the classic generation one versions of like Optimus Prime and stuff. And I was like, oh yes, they're showing like the ones that all us people that grew up with this want to see. Whereas like the first, the, the first live action Transformers with Shia LaBeouf, like you said, had it changed stuff around. Um, but um, so they brought back that, but it, they kind of made it part of the same continuity. It was like, it was weird. It was messed up because, you know, Optimus Prime looks like this because he came to earth. But they had him on Cybertron looking like this, which made no sense at all in the Bumblebee movie. Like he hadn't oh, been to I Earth. See. He hadn't been to Earth yet, you know, so he didn't do like the change. So but whatever. So but, the, um, they're like their own sentient creatures. They weren't made in a laboratory. No. It basically aliens that came in yeah. originally disguised themselves on Earth. Yeah. Okay. yeah. They're just aliens that have like a metallic, you know, like a living metallic body, you know. Yeah. You know, like and um yeah, there's a, you know, there's the live action version of it. Then there's the old school cartoon, you know, original version of how they exist. There's a couple timelines that's so like alternate realities of uh-huh. how they, I don't even know 
all of that stuff. I just dig on them. I just, yeah. like, I just you, dig you, on them. You have the, the toys and they're awesome. But I think the what I was going to say was I was just disappointed with Bumblebee because just the CGI wasn't as good. Like the budget for the movie wasn't as good. Like the story wasn't as good. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. As a spectacle, all of them are pretty like fun to watch. But in terms of story and like actually doing justice to the Transformers, they really didn't do it. Um, but which is disappointing, but oh well. Yeah. You you said you're really into movies. I, I'm surprised you haven't you're good at video editing. I'm surprised you haven't like have, have you written like any spec scripts of movies you want to make or that kind of thing? Because that's the kind of thing I have so many other interests other than music and I'll like have half ideas that like I wish I had the time and energy to devote <laughs> to like to write writing comedy. I would love to write like start like a Monty Python type troupe or I have like movie ideas it, or are there other art forms you well, whether it's movies or something else you'd like to do that you haven't yet well I do video editing right now mm-hmm. um, I'm actually taking a class right now at San Diego State in the TV film and new media I think they call it department I can't never remember it's TFM is the acronym but I can't remember what it stands for, but I'm taking a, a class of, that's w- w- the project. Our like kind of final project is to basically edit um, a movie. Like we got all the footage of all the coverage of the, of this little short movie is short film. Oh, cool. And then, so we get to edit it the way that we want to, we get to, and so, and it's pretty decent footage and it's like pretty cool. So we're learning that process and that's something that I actually really enjoy. And, and I'm actually want to build up a, portfolio or i guess they call it a reel more in this world but um i hope to start doing more editing because i already edit for like kind of um kind of i don't know how to define it more it's more documentary kind of conversation like like you like somebody that i edit for could send me this zoom session and then i would go in and edit it and make it like fix it up for them craft some narrative out of it yeah kind of or something you know um i've done that kind of thing um and a variety of things so i've done that i've done at san diego state i did we had to do like this presentation as an like an outreach thing and i took like got people students to like self-interview themselves and they sent me the Mm -hmm. footage and then i had footage of the campus and other things and so i edited it all together to make this kind of sales pitchy kind of story of what it's like being an art student at San Diego State University. So I've done things like that. But my goal, one of my goals is to do more narrative stuff. So doing this project I'm in um, school doing right now is kind of, I can use as part of my reel. And then the professor of that class said he'd give me more footage that's like that from other projects that I can edit into my own thing. Because I would really, you know, I think that would be something I'd really be into doing for a lot of reasons. It would I'm really into the idea of maintaining independence and video editing. Um, you don't need to go anywhere. Like you don't have to be right. in an office to do. You, a lot of people do it from their own places. They get, they get the footage somehow and they just do it. So um, I want to do more of that for sure as, as time goes on. And so hopefully eventually it would be awesome to get uh, credit on like some feature length something like whether it be a theater release or like a Netflix, Amazon prime type of situation. Um, but be on a feature, that would be sick. That would be so dope. (laughs) I hope that happens. Yeah. And I've, I've kind of an advantage maybe, um, because of spending so much time in the music world and doing music editing. Um, there's like somebody that's never done editing on for music. Um, has more to learn when it comes to editing for because it's one thing to edit the visuals but it's a whole nother thing to edit the, the audio right and it, they're both required so i just kind of have a little bit of a leg up because i already understand the audio editing probably way better than well anybody in the class that i'm taking for starters but but um but just a lot of people out there that want to get involved with it yeah well, well i hope that all happens Zim, it's been uh, so much fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking more when we do another what Word on the Street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get... together. I want to give you the last word. Uh, where can people find your work? Where can they reach out uh, if they want to collaborate or do anything with you? Oh, yeah. Um, well, let's see. The Zim.com is an obvious place. I have like, it's just basically, you know, what do they call it? A, a link tree these days? It's like you a have... hub for all your creative yeah. world. Yeah. I just kind of created a 
basically a link tree. So you go to the zim.com and it's just like, as you said before, I have like a ton of Etsy pages. I have all this stuff, like everything it was like, I don't know, 20 different links because there's like my YouTube channel, my podcast, my Etsy stores, you know, all these things that kind of just keep going down the thing. So that's a good place to do it. But if you're right now, I don't know what I'm hustling, trying to hustle obviously is the YouTube channel. You know, I have this goal, you know, I want to get 10,000 followers on Instagram because that's kind of like the benchmark there to do anything with it. I want to get a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube because that's like where you get the first plaque, you know, the play, oh, right, first, right, yeah. the first play button, the silver play button, I think it is. Um, and then on TikTok, so I'm also doing TikTok and um, I've, I've been kind of, for the last couple of weeks, I haven't really done much over there, but I was aggressively doing TikTok for the last six months or something making like these time-lapse portraits and things and just kind of being over there. That and feels I'm, like good content for that. I, I just made this arbitrary goal of hitting 500,000 followers um, to see if it could happen. Because TikTok is, as far as I can tell right now, it's kind of losing it, but it, it's the closest thing we have to organic discovery. Organ like if things can go viral a lot easier over there than any of the other platforms because mm -hmm. there's still like this kind of, I don't know, ability to do that. That's really hard to do on other platforms. Um, and so I'm just kind of like, I was just kind of making stuff, hoping that it would hit that TikTok stream. Like I described that YouTube stream earlier, but, um, but yeah, YouTube, youtube.com slash the Zim video is the, the channel over there at the Zim is my TikTok and at underscore the Zim is Instagram. Um, but yeah, no, this was super fun. For sure. Cool. I, yeah, I we'll, we'll link all those. Uh, yeah, we'll link the zim.com in the YouTube description yeah. here and people can follow all that. Cool, cool. Yeah, right on, man. <laughs> yeah, well, this was so much fun. Zim, uh, yeah. thanks for talking. We'll yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot for having me on. I really appreciate it. Cool. All right, later, everyone.